Thinking Critical Conflict Podcast, take two. I accidentally closed the broadcast 40 seconds into it, but today we're going to be talking about creating suspense and tension within your comic book writing. And here with me today are two good friends. They have been here from, from day one. Mark Pellegrini, the writer behind Common America, Black Ops USAGI. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing good. Next up, we have the man behind Darkwing Duck, Tokyo Pop, and all the wonderful Boom Kids uh, Disney comics that you got back in the day. How you doing, Aaron Sparrow? Doing well, doing well. So I hope everyone enjoyed us building suspension tension in the stream when I accidentally closed that earlier. <laughs> I'm a moron, and I, 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 I can't say anything else. So let's just get into the, to the description, I, and I do apologize. So tension, I personally... Tension and suspense are kind of synonyms, but when we talk about tension here, that is creating anticipation within the reader. So that's like the feeling that you give the reader, whereas suspense is going to be more like the tools and tropes that you're using to build the tension. So uh, essentially, tension itself comes from Latin meaning to stretch. It is, in a word, we'll call it anticipation. The sp suspense and storytelling, setting reader expectations up by controlling information, how much you reveal, when and how you reveal it. In its most practical sense, suspense is a series of incremental steps, and that is from masterclass.com. What are your thoughts on, on tension or tension and suspense, Aaron Sparrow? Sorry. Well, I mean, without tension and suspense, you don't really have a story. Uh, you know, there's, uh, th there's people out there that want to tell a story that's always happy and everything's always good, and, you know, the hero never has any kind of uh, challenge, you know, because they're just so excellent all the time at everything. And those stories are very boring. They don't engage the audience. You know, neuroscience has shown that the tension is the dynamic that gets you immersed and engaged emotionally and, and uh, intellectually into stories. It's what you need to have to, to have a compelling tale to really draw people in. There has to be a, some, you know, attention is a form of mystery, the mystery of what's going to happen. Is this going to be bad? Is this going to be good? So it's, it's the most critical element to building a story that engages your audience and, and, you know, makes them come back for more. Mark, it's one of the reasons that you have to create stakes because it drives the tension in your story. Right. And I mean... With tension, it also doesn't really matter if, like, if you watch, like, a Saturday morning cartoon, you could watch Thundercats, you could watch the real Ghostbusters, you could watch Transformers, you know that the heroes are going to win. That's kind of a given. But the tension doesn't come from the fact that you already know the outcome, that the heroes are going to win, because it's the kind of story it is. You want to know how they're going to win. And that's why the tension in those stories still drive the conflict and still create suspense and keep you interested. You want to know how, how are they going to get out of this one? Um, it, it keeps you guessing, like, okay, like the odds look all stacked against Optimus Prime or Spider-Man or whatever. How does he do it? How does he pull it off? You know, you pick up a Silver Age Superman comic, you know, and those are the ones where, like, uh, Superman was so powerful, he could blow out a star with his breath and he could move planets around. And he, he was basically had godlike powers. Um, and so the, the stories are built around... Uh, the tension of Lois finding out his secret identity or, or uh, Lana Lang tricking him into marrying him or something like that. And like, how is Superman going to think his way out of this one? How is he going to use his powers in a really um, unique and clever way to, to slip out of this situation? And that's, that's the tension of the story. Superman's really fat. How's he going to lose all that weight before the end of the issue? <laughs> <laughs> the Silver Age. Man. Silver so Age Superhead is so cool. <laughs> His head's a giant ant. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've got to some of the definitions, we, we started to get into this. We'll, we'll get into the why. Why is tension uh, in comic book writing or suspense in comic book writing important? Plots may be simple or complex, but suspense... And climactic progress from one incident to another are essential. This is a quote from H.P. Lovecraft. Every incident is a, in a fictional work should have some bearing on the climax or denouement. And any denouement, which is not the inevitable result of the preceding incidents, is awkward and uni uh, unliterary. <laughs> I almost said unilateral. <laughs> unliterary. <laughs> it's good advice, though. I mean, you're, the conflicts that you introduce to your character, they do need to um, relate to the plot, they can't just be non sequiturs. Otherwise, they're just pointless distractions. Uh, and that happens a lot in 
syndic like back when uh, TV shows were uh, first run syndication and they had to pump out 65 uh, scripts um, and produce them all in a year in order to get them all on TV by like, by the fall. You know, they, a lot of those those like first draft those really like quick and quick and dirty scripts would have the characters. You know, let's let's say it's Kit and he needs to go uh, and or no uh, Michael Knight and so he's he needs to go get into to Kit so that he can go chase down Carr because Carr is the actual conflict of the episode. But oh no, um, he he forgot the key to he, he lost the keys to the car. Or maybe like he on his way there he get he gets jumped by a bunch of street thugs who have nothing to do with the episode. You know that, that's, those are just distractions that don't have anything to do with the story. They're just there to pad out the time. And while that is tension and conflict, it's more annoying than it is suspenseful when stuff like that happens. Um, so when you want to introduce tension and suspense, it needs to um, be relevant to the story itself. Yeah, like into the Spider Verse, uh, you know, you've got you've got some of those elements, you know, things that are keeping you from from the main story. But you know, at the end, it's you got to plug the thingy into the thingy, and all of these characters are keeping him from, you know, keeping hold of the thingy. You know, it's sliding around. He's try having to chase after it. It's getting knocked out of his hand. You know, that's the kind of building tension that directly affects the plot. Uh, Wes, since uh, since you were. Uh, you know, so so literary there a moment ago with your H.P. Lovecraft quote. Uh, I'll tell you one of my favorites is from Aristotle that just kind of defines what tension in the story is, uh, it, which is establishing the gap between what is and what could be, and then closing and opening that gap over and over again. Yes, yeah, so these are the hmm. kind of my definition. Building tension suspense keeps readers on the edge of their seat. Emotional investment is created through the stakes that you create. And if there are no stakes, you might not even have a story, really, Paley, because there's, I'm sorry, Paley, Mark, there might not even be a reason for people to come back. Yeah, who wants to read something that's boring, honestly? I mean, even, and so tension and suspense, suspense it exists in pretty much every genre. It doesn't matter if it's if it's a romance story, the tension and suspense is will they, won't they? If it's a comedy, it could be a zany road trip movie where they got to get like Dumb and Dumb, where they got to get from A to B. How do they get there? Wacky hijinks along the way. It can be an action movie like Die Hard, where it's beat the bad guys. It could be a horror story where it's like Escape from Jason. Every single story needs to have tension and suspense and stakes, or just what the heck is it? I mean, even bad stories that are just the worst, they still at least try to have tension because you just I don't even know how you could write a story that doesn't have some sort of suspenseful element to it, some sort of conflict. Otherwise, it's just you might as well be reading like a biology textbook and something really flat and dry, because what's the point? There's a reason that every, in every kind of like romantic comedy that's produced now on film, you have that moment that's coming up. Where it's like everything's good. They met. They hit it off. You know, everything's going great. But there's that secret. There's that secret that when the person finds out, all of a sudden they feel betrayed and they break up. And then you have that sad time. And then, you know, it has to come back around again. That's, you know, another example of tension in the story. It's the, the ticking, you know, the, the ticking clock, the bomb that's waiting to go off under the table. You know, and that's not always a literal bomb. You know, sometimes it can just be a secret or, you know, a lie being exposed. You know, all kinds of things can, can build tension in your story. But that's what keeps you invested. And that's what keeps you from getting up to go to the bathroom and then just never coming <laughs> back because there's a really great arcade after, in the lobby. After The Notebook came out, I saw a lot of, of stories where you, you, you introduced the second interest like the second potential partner for the main character and they're both really nice she could not choose the guy that she should be with and that is the tension that's built which one will she choose mm -hmm. you can get a whole uh, you can get a whole terrible book series out of uh, which one will she choose <laughs> even though it's completely obvious which one it's going to be and which yeah, one do i want right? the vampire or the werewolf <laughs> oh which one <laughs> but not he's sparkles that's the rule <laughs> <laughs> she should have chosen the Gill Man. Just throw everybody off. Like, I'm going to go with Gill Man. <laughs> yeah, why don't you settle down with that nice Frankenstein's monster? <laughs> so it's important to have conflict, and, and there are different different types of suspense or tension. We'll, we'll get, kind of get into that now. That exists. There are five types that we're going to talk about here. Maybe Aaron or Mark will bring up another one. And I'm going to use the Lord of the Rings for the most part as examples of most of these. You have your tension with your protagonist, i.e. Frodo leaving the Shire and being uncertain about the world that's out there. He, there's, there's conflict within himself whether he wants to do that. Tension between characters. Frodo losing faith within the Fellowship and whether or not he trusts them anymore and eventually he, he kind of abandons them and he and uh, Samwise go off on their own adventure. You have tension within a scene. Can the Fellowship escape Moria? 
you know, and all the monsters and, and everything going on there. And then you have the tension within the story. Will Frodo live to destroy the ring? That is going on throughout the entire story. And then you can also have, and something you'll definitely see a lot in comic books, Aaron, tension with the narrator. Is the narrator reliable? Is he feeding lies? When I'm seeing what he's saying, and then when I see what's happening in the comic book, they don't always quite match up right. Why is that? Well, you know, it depends on, you know, things are told from different characters' points of view. And that's something that seems to be forgotten on Twitter as people complain when something happens in a story. Uh, because the narrator is not always reliable. The narrator is told maybe from the main character's point of view, and maybe their point of view is skewed. Or maybe you have an omniscient narrator that is more of kind of, uh, you know, it's almost as if you've got a mischievous, you know, omnipresent trickster god in charge of the story. You know, so those things are, are done to mislead you and to kind of, you know, throw different elements into your story. One of the, uh, it, yeah, you know, you may be getting a, a story told from the villain's point of view, and they're going to have a very distinct point of view. And, and people nowadays t tend to attribute the point of view of the characters to the writer. If a character says something, it must be something, you know, and the character says something horrible. Oh, that must be something that the, that the writer believes. But no, the idea is that you are creating different characters. You're creating different points of views that are going to rub up against each other and cause tension and conflict. And sometimes those, some of those views are going to be odious. That's, that's storytelling. And they're going to make you uncomfortable as a reader. That builds tension as well. Exactly. Because one of the best jokes from of exploring ideas. So one of the best jokes from The Simpsons on, on uh, the nature of, of perspectives was when they're going to Japan and Homer's all pouty because he doesn't want to go to Japan. Marge is trying America to like, uh, console him. Uh, yeah, it, she's trying to console him. She's like, "Come on, Homer, you like Japan? You liked Rashomon?" He's like, "That's not the way I remember it." And <laughs> yeah, for people who've seen Rashomon, so Rashomon was the Akira Kurosawa film that was. Um, it popularized the idea of having the same story told from multiple perspectives of different characters. And so the story plays out differently. It has the same cast, it has the same um, plot, but it plays out differently depending on which narrator is telling the story from their POV. And I know that seems cliche now because so many people have knocked that off. I think there's even a really good episode of Batman, the animated series called POV, which does like Rashomon, but from like the GCPD's point of view of their encounter with Batman. And it's a really good episode, but that's a good example of if you want to do if you want to study a story that um, shows you how the same plot can be told from different um, perspectives, and you can have four unreliable narrators um, that think that they're reliable. Um, Rashomon is you know one of those great uh, study materials. We did a uh, an issue of Darkwing Duck that was uh, basically we took an old story uh, uh, that introduced Fluffy, uh, one of the uh, villains from the Disney Adventures comic book series and we wanted to bring him kind of into mainstream continuity uh, and we so we essentially had to retell his origin story and I didn't want to stray too far from the original because you know I, I like to stick to the source material so I had to come up with a new framing device for it and that framing device became Darkwing is telling the story of that adventure to you know Honker and to Goslin and he is the most unreliable narrator <laughs> that you've ever seen because number one <laughs> his, his ego is out of control but there is a point where Goslin challenges him on whether or not something happened that way. And he tells her that he has a mind like a diamond and he remembers every detail exactly. And then you immediately cut back and he and Launch Launchpad both have handlebar mustaches and are wearing jerky hats. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and he is much taller than Launchpad. So it's, you know, it's one of those things that you immediately reveal. Yeah, the narrator in this is completely off the rails. So your mileage may well, vary. One of the things I like about the Darkwing cartoon was that I think the, the cartoon had three separate origins for Darkwing, but the only one that, that's really accepted as canon is the one with uh, Megavolt at their high school uh, like prom, because Megavolt also remembers those events. So you have, a, uh, you have someone who can confirm that at least some version of those events happened. So sometimes you can have an unreliable narrator, but if you bring in someone who can at least confirm part of their story, you at least know that a percentage of it is true. Yeah, we were going to do about four more origins for him too if the series kept going <laughs> we had a bunch of different plans that were a lot of fun so sorry guys i was just kind of fixing up i guess the the other stream that i accidentally left a little bit early before we finished up this conversation was still live i wanted to remove that so i don't should you have all types of tension building within your story mark or should you stick with one no, I'm, I mean, I think you also brought up a great example of how to have multiple um, suspenseful arcs in a single story. Because if you have multiple characters who are all following their own separate arcs and going off in different directions, well, each one of them 
needs to have tension and suspense or else why are you even bothering with that person? Lord of the Rings, which you brought up is of course a great example. Everybody splinters off after Fellowship of the Ring and goes in their own direction. Merry and Pippin go one way, uh, the Fellowship goes another, uh, Frodo and, and uh, Sam go another way, and they each encounter their own problems along their own paths. And so every time the narrative cuts back and we see we catch up with what you know Sam is doing or what Frodo is doing, what, what uh, Gandalf is doing, they all have their own problems. And it does create this great feeling of and suspense. If they, they're because, all interconnected. If they fail, yeah. the other one's going to fail. Yeah, right. So like, yeah. um, uh, they, uh, uh, Mary and Pippin, you know, they go off in their direction and they encounter the Ents, you know, which and they have to convince convince the Ents, you know, Treebeard to uh, to take up arms ag against uh, Saruman, and then that goes back to uh, with the Fellowship and fighting Saruman with Gandalf and all them, and you know, it interconnects everything that one person does down their um, roots. Eventually, fl their little um, avenue flows back to the others and it all has like reverberations uh but it also creates this this sense of like absolute you know uh impossible odds where it doesn't matter who the character is how powerful they are they could be as strong as gandalf or as small and weak as frodo doesn't matter which path they go down they still meet impossible odds and it just feels like how are these characters going to win because no matter who they are no matter what path they take they come up against an entire army or something that's unstoppable and it makes that ending feel so satisfying when they finally when they finally go through 10 million miles of bad road because they walked so far and they finally destroy that ring and even after they destroy the ring they got to get off mount doom before the lava kills them and even after they get off mount doom they got to go stop saruman and his thugs from destroying the shire it's like there's just no end to it you know by the time it's all over it just feels like they've been through a meat grinder <laughs> This is why flaws are so important in your characters as well. It's something that a lot of writers have moved away from. A lot of current comic writers have moved away from because the character has to be representative now of a group and therefore can't have any flaws because then you're you know, saying that about the entire group, which is ridiculous. But if you think of the terms of Frodo and Sam, their flaw in the story that they have to carry out is that they are small and they are weaker and they are defenseless. You know, they essentially are, they're not good fighters. They, you know, they live in the Shire their whole life. They, this world is strange and, and the dangers are foreign to them. Whereas somebody like Strider wouldn't have that same choice. You would think Strider physically is, is more the character that you would want to carry the ring. But the idea is that Frodo has the moral center to resist the ring longer and therefore has a better chance of success at that portion of it. But the whole reason for the fellowship was because they were all supposed to balance out each other's weaknesses. Now that they're broken and they're splintered apart, they each have challenges that are going to directly intersect with their areas of weakness. And that's what that's another way that you build tension. And that's, you know, they, you have to overcome obstacles in order for the story to be compelling. Right. And that's an, another, I'm sorry, just real quick. That's another great matter of perspective sticking with Lord of the Rings is that just because um, a task or a conflict um, is, is beneath one character doesn't mean that it can't um, be a impossible odd for another character. So, I mean, you've got Gandalf fighting um, the Balrog, you know, <laughs> like, like giving him an actual sword fight and stabbing him to death and falling through the pits of the earth to, to defeat a Balrog. You know, that's a huge thing. Um, but then you see, uh, and then you see like Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli just taking out whole like squads and platoons of orcs. But then you get to Frodo and Sam when um, they're in uh, Gorogoroth and they and they get taken prisoner. And just how much of a struggle it is to kill one orc. I think they have to trick it into killing itself, like falling down the stairs or something. Or they trick them into fighting each other, and the two orcs kill each other. Like just one orc is a tremendous challenge for those two characters because as Aaron pointed out, they're small and they're weak. They're not Legolas and Aragorn, they're certainly not Gandalf. But the challenge, the conflict from their perspective feels as big as a Balrog because they're seeing it through the eyes of a hobbit. So an orc to a hobbit is as much of a challenge as a Balrog to a wizard. And you get that perspective and it still works. It still feels um, Re really uh, suspenseful to the reader. And to put it in comics perspectives, you know, like uh, Darkseid is a challenge for Superman, whereas Batman, but that doesn't mean that um, the Riddler isn't an, isn't a challenge to Batman, you know, uh, just the way the stories are written is that Batman has to outthink the, this super genius criminal, whereas Superman has to outpunch this um, alien despot warlord. Uh, doesn't mean that one is, is more of a conflict than the other. It's just from the different perspectives, they're, they're both suspenseful. So, Aaron, I want to talk about a somewhat recent comic book story that I thought did amazing work building tension. It's from Jeff Johns. It's called uh, Blackest Night. 
if you've read that one. And the cool thing about that is, is we introduced the, the black ring and the black, you know, lantern core. It's essentially represents death. And as it's taking all these characters and there's characters that, that are still alive that love those characters, the one thing that it's smart in doing and building the tension and suspense is there's hope that they can come back if they can destroy the, the black ring bear, like the main character, that those characters that, that, that have, we've lost, those uh, loved ones that have been lost along the way, they can actually be brought back to life. And I think it's, it's, it's important to have that light on the end of the tunnel. It can't be so dark that you could, even if you won, it would, wouldn't be good. You know what I mean? The Pyrrhic victory is, is a, uh, you know, it's something that you should use sparingly where, you know, the, the character wins, but at what cost? Uh, you know, it costs them more to win than, uh, you know, typically that's something that you do in a story with villains. The villain achieves their goal, but, you know, to what end? You know, what did it, uh, it's it's the moment with Thanos at the end of Infinity War, which, you know, is pretty, you know, hammered home when she said, uh, when Gamora, the young Gamora says in the Soul Stone, what did it cost you? And he says, everything. You know, so it, it's, he succeeded, yes, but it took everything that he had and it cost him the one thing in the universe that he actually cared about. You know, th that's a Pyrrhic victory, but he still smiles at the end because he still achieved his goal because Thanos is evil to his core. But when it comes to stories of heroic fiction, the, the entire reason that you want to have a happy ending is because, and the reason that that's satisfying for your reader is because we all have our own struggles. We all have our, our million things that we're trying to overcome every day. And that's you know something that I always try and think about when dealing with people is they're, they've got a struggle that I know nothing about. So I'm going to, you know, be even nicer to them than I normally would because I don't know what they're dealing with. But we're all going through that all the time. And so when you see a story where the characters triumph over adversity, it makes you feel good because it reminds you that in real life, you too can triumph over adversity. And that's the whole point of heroic fiction is to remind us of what is achievable. This, this current trend of watering everything down to a level where we feel safe and comfortable and hey, you don't really have to try because you're great just the way you are. That's that there's something in that that is completely antithetical to the human experience. People want catharsis in their recreational media. Um, it's unsatisfying if they don't get it. Now, it's nice if um, a downer ending happens every once in a while, you know, just as a change of pace. But just as a person who likes horror movies, I'm going to watch Critters a lot more than I'm going to watch The Strangers or um, The Descent. Like those are our horror movies that have no catharsis whatsoever. They have absolutely brutal, unpleasant, unsatisfying endings where the people struggle and try so hard and they don't make it out and the, the villains or the monsters win and they're good movies, they're perfectly fine, but you, they're not feel good movies. I just wanna watch Critters where uh, Steve from American Dad throws a, a firecracker into the spaceship and blows up all the aliens. That's catharsis. That makes me feel good at the end of the movie. Um, I'd rather watch that. It's kind of like the difference between, you know, Alien, Aliens, and Alien 3. Um, Alien and Aliens end with Ripley defeating the, the xenomorphs and making it out uh, with, with her, her life. Everybody else is dead or injured, but she gets out of it okay. Alien 3 ends with... Uh, all of her struggles meaning nothing, and she has to kill herself to kill the final queen alien. Um, and it's just an unpleasant downer ending to her storyline, and it's so unsatisfying, and it just makes you feel bad, um, especially compared to the way Alien ended. Alien. You know, yeah, but, you know, just, <laughs> they undid the Alien Resurrection, but made me more after uh, after James Cameron's Aliens. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, I, I guess I just fever dreamed Alien Three, right? What was I thinking? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I watched Reckon for a Dream once. I'll never do it again. Everybody, yeah. is, there's no happy ending for anyone. So let's talk about some of the ways that we can build tension and stakes. And oh, I noticed Aaron. that we were we were having some technical difficulties with Aaron. It felt like he was uh, a tad bit behind. So hopefully if he comes back in, we'll yeah. have a better connection. But let's we can still talk about ways of building tension. Uh, these are just some of the, the devices that I'm going to talk about here. Inside, uh, the inciting incident, the thing that starts driving the story, Ticking clock, that's definitely a trope we see a lot for building tension and stakes. Withheld information from the hero or potentially even the, uh, the, the reader. Plot twist, conflict, backstory, and cliffhanger. What, what ways do you find work the best in building tension, Mark? So you have two there that um, are almost the exact opposites of each other, and they both work just depending on the execution. 
So um, Aaron mentioned the the Hitchcock bomb under the table uh, principle, which I think we may have talked about in a in a different stream, uh, but just because it's it's um, contextually applicable to this stream. So the Hitchcock bomb under the table principle is that two characters are sitting at a table, uh, casually talking to each other. From the perspective of the audience where the camera's at, we can see a ticking time bomb underneath the table. We know that that bomb is going to explode, but the characters don't. So the audience has information that the characters within the narrative don't have, and that creates suspense not for the characters, but for the audience. It, it breaks the fourth wall in a way. So we're not um, secondhand feeling their suspense. We're feeling our own suspense because we know something they don't. And then that creates that part of the narrative where we're yelling at the scream at, at the screen or whatever at the TV or at the at the book or whatever to like get up run away the bomb's gonna blow up the characters have no idea um, and that's the opposite of you know what we we traditionally think of as conflict in a narrative where you know the characters are up against odds maybe they're being chased through the woods by an, an axe wielding maniac and that's the conflict right there we are secondhand feeling the main character's conflict because and their suspense because it's right there up front and we're feeling it parallel to them. Um, it all just depends on the execution. Sometimes it can get really annoying if the audience knows something that the characters don't. And if you hold out too long on that, um, it doesn't You're waiting for the, the, the hero to catch up with you. Exactly. You're waiting for the, the characters to catch up with what you already know. And you get to the point, though, in the narrative where especially if it's information like plot points, someone has to ex in, within the narrative, someone has to explain those plot points to the cast of the character, uh, the character of the story. And then that's boring for you as the reader or the uh, or the audience because they're just saying things you already know and that you've known for a long time. But within the the confines of that narrative, someone has to tell it to the character, and that's that's boring. You don't want to do it that way. So if you're going to to do the withheld information technique, um, you have to make sure that you do it in a way that um, doesn't bore the reader. Don't draw it out too long. Um, if you have to get to the uh, explanation point, uh, don't draw that out either because you're just telling the audience stuff they already know. Uh, a good example, a good okay. example of that, uh, and uh, not. Uh, giving your, uh, you know, wait, waiting to catch up to the character is the uh, the Green Lantern film and then the uh, the cut and paste uh, version of that script, which is called Captain Marvel, uh, <laughs> you know, where the audience is given so much, you're front loaded with so much information. They tell you everything about the Green Lantern Corps right at the beginning. In Captain Marvel, we know everything about her and we know that she lost her memory and we know that she's from Earth. And then the, the move, rest of the movie is that character catching up to what It's we like we're watching know. Jason Bourne in reverse. <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't care, and you know, especially no. in the in the case of Green Lantern, that once you get to the scene where he's on Oa and uh, Sinestro and and Kilowog are explaining training him and explaining everything to him, we already know this, so there's no mystery, and we're not going along with the character. Whereas opposed to a movie like Star Wars, you kind of get a glimpse of the Empire, you don't know what this is all about, and then we immediately go to farm boy Luke Skywalker, and we pick up the story with him, and now he has to go explore this world that we've only gotten a hint of. And so we're discovering how weird and how strange it is, and you know what the oppressive nature of the Empire is through him. And you know that carries you on, you know, you learn it as you go with him. So he is your, he's your cipher, he's putting you in the story. And in a lot of ways, that's a more, you know, it's not always the way to go, but it is a very effective tool to, uh, to so, in the tension of your story. Aaron, talking about comic books specifically, because, you know, this is a comic writing uh, cliffhangers. It feels like there are some writers that think that is the only way to create tension or suspense or to get a consumer to come back and read the next issue. It feels like there are some writers that every single comic issue is a cliffhanger and there's never resolution and it gets annoying as hell after a while. Do you have an example of a comic that is annoying you, Wes? <laughs> I have is lots of kind of examples of comics <laughs> that annoy me. Specifically, Brian Michael Bendis almost never ever ends a st comic story, but there's always a last page cliffhanger that's supposed to get you back for the next issue. Well, I think that's Bendis trying to play to his strengths because I think that he realized that he can't end a story. He has, you know, these ideas that don't go anywhere. You know, if you think of all the crossovers he did at Marvel, you know, where I started to realize that, that Bendis was, uh, was a paper tiger as far as uh, storytelling went was, uh, what was a Secret Empire. When the big finale to the storyline was Tony Stark drops a helicarrier on Sentry who just took a ton of you know, shots from Mjolnir with, with all of Thor's strength and just shrugged it off. But you just drop a helicarrier on him and, oh, now he's now he's taken out. Uh, and then, you know, oh, what was it? They blew up Wasp. That was the big finale. 
they, you know, that was the end game. We're, we're going to blow up the wasp. And I was like, who cares? Why, why did I invest in this at all? Why did I read this story? There, there's no, there, you know, you have to have the ending to your story. The tension has to build to a release that Mark has said is cathartic. You know, you have to feel so like, it wow. It should be a crescendo. Was... It should be moving up towards the, yeah, towards the big climax. Just, and what's just the lead in, and this is the problem Marvel has right now, is that their crossovers are just the lead into the next crossover. You know, hey, here's Absolute Carnage. But, you know, hey, that wasn't the Glass real Last page reveal, yeah. You know, the real threat is King in Black. <laughs> You know, you think of how ineffectually Marvel is doing that right now. And then you take a story, uh, you know, stepping back outside comic books, you take a story like Breaking Bad, where every obstacle that's removed, you have that moment of, re of relief of like, oh, God, they got past that obstacle. But it, there's another horror waiting behind it. That obstacle was holding something, someone worse in check. And now that person is, is released and, and, you know, things are going to get even worse. That, that's effective, you know, and it got to an ending that actually had a crescendo and actually ended. So... Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying about that. You know, you ha you can't just end everything on a cliffhanger. You can't use the same tool over and over. It gets stale. People, it gets predictable. People know what's going to happen. You know, you can't always end your book on the hero get, or, or a character getting stabbed from behind. You know, oh, no, they've been stabbed from behind. Well, you know, they're going to be fine. <laughs> Not it's again. Not yeah, it's, you know, oh, Black Man has stabbed, uh, stabbed Aquaman through the chest. I'm sure this is going to stick. Yeah, I'm sure this has ramifications. You know, so, again, stakes are important. Well, the, the alternative Mark. to that, the uh, yeah, what's up? No, no, keep keep going. No, so, I mean, the the alternative to that is of having every um, installment in your story end on a cliffhanger, is that you you can have each story, each chapter in your ongoing narrative tell a complete tale, just not resolve every plot conflict and save those for later. Like you did a video that was really good, um, Wes, a few uh, weeks ago with, I think it was with Perch on one of the best Batman storylines in history, Strange Apparitions. Um, and in that storyline, there is an ongoing conflict. There's several of them. There's Hugo Strange, and then there's Batman's romance with Silver St. Cloud that's being developed over several issues. But each issue is its own independent story about the Penguin, about the Joker, about Dr. Phosphorus, um, I think that one's actually Dead a shot. harder, but yeah, Deadshot. Um, and then it ends, it come, it finally builds up to an ending with uh, Hugo Strange and then the fallout with uh, Silver St. Cloud. But each story is its own independent episode with a beginning, middle, and end, its own three-act structure with resolution. But there is a plot conflict going on in the background that is also building tension towards the next story. And you're wondering, like, when is that going to come to a head? Uh, we have a resolution to Joker's laughing fish plot, but we don't have a resolution to whatever Hugo Strange is up to. We don't have a resolution to this romance with Silver St. Cloud. That's still ongoing. What's going to happen next? And that's the hook that keeps the reader, even if that one issue tells a complete story, there's still more going on that's unresolved. Um, just for a personal example, Common America, um, that Tim and I, we plot out the first saga. Um, issue one ends with uh, the characters after they've... Uh, beaten the bad guy back at um, at Carly's uh, homestead, basically decompressing. And they don't know where these monsters, these mud monsters are coming from. They're, they've just defeated the conflict of that particular issue. Issue two, um, and similarly, they're all back at the homestead decompressing from their adventure. They Now they know where the mud monsters came from, but they don't know who the villain Vermilion Masquerade is. Volume three ends differently though. Volume three ends on a cliffhanger. Um, with the reveal of, of that villain, Vermilion Masquerade, her identity, but it ends on, on a very like a tense note. We don't know what happens next. Uh, we mix it up. Each volume mm -hmm. tells a complete story, but we don't end them all the same way because then that would be tacky or annoying. Just Strange Apparitions was actually uh, the uh, inspiration for the way that we were doing the second volume of Darkwing Duck, whereas we had the longer mystery of how Negaduck was back. Uh, you know, and what his ultimate plan was. But, you know, each issue you would get, you know, a little individual story that was like, oh, well, you know, Splatter Phoenix shows up and now there's this romp through a Comic-Con, you know, but the subplot is always there, that ticking clock of, you know, what are we building towards and dropping little clues along the way that, you know, hopefully were subtle enough that once we got to the big finale, readers would be able to look back and go, oh, I see what they were doing. I see how they were seeding this all along. So the last one, I do want to have a just a quick example. We just reviewed... Uh, Iron Man 198 through 200. Do you remember that one, Mark? It's basically um, the introduction of Iron Monger, and we get. The, I, I've read the, that story. I, I I didn't catch your video because it's actually really long. That, and I didn't have right. time to watch the whole thing. But I, I have read the entire um, Iron Monger storyline. It's one of my favorites. Okay, so in 198, one of the ways that they build tension within the story is we get the backstory of Obadiah Stane, and you mm -hmm. see just 
where he kind of, uh, you know, his father killed himself playing Russian roulette. And then you saw the progression of just how he became more and more evil and understanding just how diabolical Obadiah Stane was and what he would do to destroy Tony Stark absolutely builds tension in that story. And when he finally wins, it's that much more satisfying. So, and it's really satisfying too because the Obadiah Stane story arc wasn't just three issues. He had been in the background um, like manipulating 15, and messing 15. with Stark for like a long time. Yeah. And it finally came to a head in that big three issue arc where he basically becomes an evil Iron Man, Iron Monger. Um, and that just the fact that that storyline finally came to a head was really satisfying. But it had been going on in the background between all these other Iron Man storylines. Um, and that ending with Obadiah, the way. Obadiah defeats himself, I guess. I don't want to give it away. It's a, I guess it's a 40-year-old storyline, but he takes that that sort of victory away from Tony at the last second, so you do get catharsis because his, his threat has been uh, neutralized, but you don't quite get that 100% satisfaction because Tony doesn't quite get that win. He yeah, defeats but he, Obadiah, but he doesn't get to He admits he's a jail. loser, because yeah. that's what he said about his father when he killed himself. That was yep. because he was a loser, and when he did it to himself, that was admitting and, and, to himself that he was a loser. Exactly. And it works so well with the background that I mean, we get the tragic backstory for Obadiah. And, you know, spoiler alert for a video that's going to probably come out in a couple of days between me and Wes. We talk about um, characters with tragic backstories and why those don't always justify terrible actions or, um, or redemption. And Obadiah Stane is a great example of how to do that. He has his tragic backstory and it feeds into the end of his storyline, um, the way it concludes in number 200. But uh, it doesn't give him redemption because he can't be redeemed no matter how sad his backstory is. And it's, it's such a satisfying storyline, um, the way it, it finally ends. Um, but yeah, that, that's, a, that's another example of a character who has this, um, he's, he's a threat who's been lingering in the background for several issues across several other independent stories. And then it finally pays off at the end. And it's the satisfaction you don't get from a J.J. Abrams-style mystery box storyline. And I feel like this is the video where we can finally really talk about mystery box storytelling and why it's just the worst. Um, so mystery box storytelling is that um, from, J from J.J. Abrams' TED Talk, where now everybody's like, oh, he had a TED Talk, so this must be the way you're supposed to write stories. <laughs> oh, the TED Talk, he must be smart. Yeah, but basically you have an empty box with nothing inside of it, and all the suspense is um, the mystery of what's inside the box. You don't have to have anything in the box. That's not what matters. What matters is the suspense they, of what's what in the box. Yeah. So basically it is all um, flash over substance. It's hollow cat. storytelling. Yep, exactly. It's like <laughs> you don't have to think your plot threads out. You don't have to have a conclusion in mind. You don't have to have a resolution. You don't have to have substance or catharsis. You just have to tease the audience. You have to cock tease the audience long enough until they finally just lose interest. And then your TV series, your lost series gets canceled or people just don't care anymore and the ratings die. It's very much a television perspective. Um, X Files, as much as I enjoy X Files, Chris Carter had a mystery box approach to that. He did not have a resolution or a conclusion in mind. A, like how do all these, how does this alien conspiracy mythology come together? He didn't have that in mind. He just strung it along. And then when audiences finally got bored with it, that's when the ratings tanked. And when he finally resolved it, um, no one cared anymore. And then he tried to do two more seasons and nobody cared anymore. And the series got uh, canceled. It's kind of the opposite of Twin Peaks, which um, both X-Files and Lost and a lot of media are all inspired by uh, Twin Peaks. That one with the Laura Palmer mystery, it wasn't mystery box storytelling. They knew who the, the killer was from the very beginning. They plotted all the character arcs and storytelling around the mystery of who the killer was. They resolved that mystery halfway through season two and then realized, shit, we got to tell another like 20 episodes, um, but we've already resolved our conflict. And then that's what got... Twin Peaks canceled was that they had to do 20 pointless episodes to fill out the season, but it's not a mystery box. They had a plot and they had a, um, the substance to it. They just actually ended it too early. Kind of the exact opposite of a, of a mystery box. When so, Todd McFarlane left amazing Spider-Man and he went to, uh, by the way, the tension of this stream is will Wes be able to keep Aaron and, uh, <laughs> and Mark on topic. That's yeah. <laughs> being in Wes's face right now. But you uh, just to bring it back to comics. When Todd McFarlane left Amazing Spider-Man and he went to his own, you know, adjectiveless Spider-Man, uh, he told a story with Craven and Calypso, and at the end of that, it, it came to no satisfying conclusion. And the point of his story was sometimes in life you don't get all the answers. 
And that is that very sucks. true, <laughs> but it's not a satisfying story. So, you know, this is not real life. You know, you want to bring in elements from real life into your stories, but this is not real life where sometimes you don't get all the answers. Sometimes, you know, things just are a mystery. You know, your audience is there. You have promised them a story. You have promised to take them on a ride. And part of that ride is the finale. Torment is the crap, one of the crappiest story, Spider-Man storylines I've ever read. I mean, yes, it, it gets like the Marvel premiere treatment because it has that Todd McFarlane art, which is beautiful. But it is just six agonizing issues of Spider-Man fighting the lizard. Just six consecutive issues of him fighting the lizard across the city. And no matter how good McFarlane's art is, that is boring. And it just goes on and on and on. And after six issues, six months, if you were reading it back in the day... You get to the ending, and it's a non-ending with no conclusion, and it just does that that uh, um, subverts your expectations. You Last you remains. Gonna, yeah, you this big story arc with no ending. Yep, you thought you were going to find out what the deal is, but nope, sorry, Calypso's still out there, and her origin's a mystery, and you're just going to have to hang on and find out. Like, I just spent six months or six issues of this story. And I get nothing out of it but a bunch of vacuous, pretty art. And you know what? That explains the the original like first couple years of Image like down to a T. Lots of pretty art from the best artists in the industry. No story whatsoever in any of those plots. And within a year, every single one of them, except Eric Larson, hired writers to write their stories for them. And in the case of Spawn, that didn't even right, buddy. resolve the problem with Spawn. <laughs> I already did the Image Comics video. I know you did. We're, we're kind of repeating that, but just because it's on topic with this video is that so Spawn. That was another one of those cases because I, I just saw in the chat that um, someone said like keep it on comics, guys. Let's talk comic guys. Sorry, Jasper. I know we're talking about movies and TV so much. So here's one for comics. Spawn. We're, we're talking about I've genre, so you know it, it's still yeah. Fits. I mean, I read. I like Spawn. I was a diehard Spawn follower, and it took me 200 issues to cancel my subscription when I finally saw the light. But the whole purpose of Spawn from the first issue from the out outset is that Armageddon is coming. Um, you're the superhero from hell. You're a hell spawn. You're one of the devil's infantry, Al, Al Simmons, and you need to get with the program. You have a power meter. And uh, once that power meter goes down to zero, you go back to hell and you become the pawn of Mount Bolgia and then Armageddon's going to happen. And like, okay, so we've got something that we're building to in Spawn. We know that we're working our way to Armageddon. We have that power meter. And we know that once those numbers that start out at 99999 go down to zero, that's when Armageddon's going to happen. Oh boy, I can't wait. I think it was 147 issues before they finally got to Armageddon. It took a long time to get to that arc. And uh, I know, you just said we got to get the show moving, but we're on topic. Um, no, we really are It took aren't. forever to, to get there. <laughs> I, we took forever to get to uh, Armageddon. And they actually even forgot about the power meter. The power meter disappeared for like 75 issues for like six years um, of the comic because they just like got so off track. By the time they finally got on track and got to Armageddon at like issue 150, who the F cares anymore? Who was reading Spawn by then besides me? They took too long to get to the point. And even if they had an end point in mind, they strung it out for too long and just no one cares about Spawn anymore. It's not true. It's one of the best-selling comics of Image because they finally paid it off in Spawn 300. Oh, they finally paid it off by Spawn 300. Good Lord. See, you just uh, jumped out too quick, Mark. You only had 100 more issues to go. <laughs> exactly. I, I'll tell you why I jumped out. Maybe this is a, a thing for another only day. Only 229 I'm, uh, more dollars spent. Oh, <laughs> God. I actually jumped out of Spawn when they changed the main character from Al Simmons to D Jim Downing. And he was the most milk toast, boring, uninteresting leads. And I, I think I actually stuck on with him because he was still the main character by issue 200. So I think he was the main character of Spawn for like 30 issues. And he was so boring, I finally dropped out. <laughs> He's what killed that book for me. All right. Well, let's move on to some of the tips for creating tension. So you can these are things that you can do within your writing for your comic books. You can write shorter sentences. It increases the pace of your story. Shorter words does the same thing. You can start your story near the end and do flashbacks to cover some of the information that you wanted to start. And that way you kind of get it moving towards the, the natural conclusion and people uh, are ready for that end point. You can use death to create tension that, that creates stakes. Reveal information over time. Don't reveal everything in the very first issue, your zero issue. I hate the zero issue concept at this point. Give me the information I need as we go along in the story. Absolutely builds tension over time much better. Internal conflict within the characters, you could definitely use uh, 
internal monologuing. Keep the keep the readers guessing. Don't give them all the answers. You can use multiple sources uh, of, for your tension and conflict on your main character. Avoid excessive exposition. Avoid static storytelling. Things need to be moving, and but don't string the readers along too long. We've already talked that one about about that one a bit. Aaron, do you have any good tips for utilizing and creating tension within the comic book medium itself? Oh, gosh. I knew you were going to hit me with this one because my mind just totally blanked as you were reading that. Because I was listening and I was like, oh, yeah, this is all good information. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's, you know, you have to have emotional stakes and you have to have physical stakes. You know, there has to be uh, a challenge to the heroes. You know, will they, will the bomb go off? Will they blow up? Will they, you know, will they? I hate to do this, Aaron. Uh, you think about Die Hard. Okay. You got the stakes that you've got these ter terrorist organization at Nakatomi Plaza. But you've Absolutely. got the emotional stakes that he's trying to repair his relationship with his wife and get his family back. That is the core of the story. The core of the story is, you know, will this guy be able to put his family back together? Uh, but it just so happens that it's against a backdrop of a bunch of terrorists taking over the building that they're in. So now he not only has to rescue his family, you know, from terrorists, but he also has to rescue his family from being broken apart. And uh, there's something, you know, very satisfying about both of those things. It's, it's why it was such a successful film, because it resonated not only as an action film, but it resonated as a drama. Human level stakes, relationships. Yes. And it's it's one of the reasons I think that, you know, I, I don't want this to sound like I'm just a singling, uh, singling out a specific gender, but it's one of the reasons that Die Hard is an action movie that not only appeals to men, but that also appeals to women. Because women are more likely to be invested in the emotional stakes of the story than men are sometimes. Sometimes we just want to see things kick ass. We're very basic. But, you know, Sean, Wick, you know, with that dog, though, man, you got to. Yeah. <laughs> I identify with that. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's why we love Jason Statham movies. You know, the transport is great because he's just, you know, beating his way through a bunch of guys. And, you know, but there's a, a physical challenge to be met. But there's not a lot of, you know, I mean, there is the. Uh, the tension is, is he going to break his own rules? <laughs> yeah, exactly. If that's, it's the right thing set it to up, do. You know, and that's and that's what works in The Dark Knight is, you know, the Joker says, I'm going to make you break your one rule. And the question is, will he will he actually succeed in doing that? So, so I think Joe you're... Brett has a question here. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Is it possible to build tension in a short five-page story? Absolutely. What do you think? Absolutely. It's, I... it's more challenging. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that I had to do for uh, our pitch to Disney was the uh, the Juggernaut story was originally a very uh, short, uh, I think it was five to eight pages uh, of storytelling. And so I had to I had to condense everything down into just that that narrative thrust of what the uh, what the tension was. And the tension was that this character is unstoppable. And, you know, they have to figure out how to beat him. He's stronger than any villain that Darkwing has ever faced. You know, just physically, he's just beyond what, what Darkwing can handle. And so there's that building tension of that. And then there's also the building tension of the threat to Goslin because Goslin gets involved in the story in a way that puts her in immediate danger. And it's, he, you know, the Juggernaut is coming for Goslin and Darkwing cannot physically stop her. So, yeah. I think so another, the, here's, here's another one. I, I'll, I, have, I read, uh, was it, Green Lantern 80th anniversary episode. There's a comic book by... Or the story in there by Robert Mediti, one of my favorite writers. It's a short story. Obviously, it's an anthology. And you have John Stewart, Hal Jordan, and you have Guy Gardner at a bar drinking beers, reminiscing about their times together in the Green Lantern Corps. I'm sorry. Guy Gardner is not there. It's um, the artist. The Green Lantern, that's an artist. Yeah, we know who you're talking about. Yeah, what's <laughs> the his name? Green Lantern. What Kyle the Kyle, yeah. <laughs> Kyle Rader. Guy <laughs> Gardner is not there, and they're telling stories and drinking beers and reminiscing about their time in the core. And you're wondering the whole time, where is Guy? Are they waiting on him? And it builds the tension as he's not there. And then you find out in the final page that they are reminiscing and remembering Guy Gardner because he passed away. In the last two pages, you start getting flashbacks to actually what happened to him. And it absolutely builds tension until they go to the, uh, the gravesite. Now, I know that that... This is not a comic story and everything, but that reminds me of one of the saddest things I ever saw on TV as a kid that made me like utterly inconsol inconsolable. Uh, right after Jim Henson died, they did a um, TV special called The Muppets Remember Jim Henson. And Jim Henson died in 1991, so I was six years old, so I was really young. And I, I hadn't really you know, understood that Jim Henson was gone. And that special is brutal because it, it starts out at the Muppet Theater and the Muppets are all, they find out that 
their friend Jim Henson is coming to visit them at the Muppet Theater. And so they all get together and they're all really excited, but they don't know who Jim Henson is. Like our friend Jim Henson, we've never met him, who is he? And so the whole special is just a retrospective on the life and the works and the career of Jim Henson. We all And the Muppets get to know him, find out who he was and everything, find out how he created the Muppets, how they related to him. And so at the very end, they're all really excited, like, oh boy, I can't wait till Jim Henson gets here. What do we do to pass the time until he shows up? Let's read some fan mail. And so they're reading like actual fan mail from actual fans. And the first one, Kermit, um, Kermit's not in it yet. Um, the first one they read, like Fozzie's reading it, is like, um, I loved your show, Muppets. I loved your movies. You are all very funny. It's from an actual kid. I'm very sorry to hear that Jim Henson, your friend, has died. And it's just like silence. And all the Muppets like, died? And they start reading more actual fan letters. And like that tension, like we know that Jim Henson's dead because the memorial is the whole special is memorial, but the Muppets don't know until the very end when it finally breaks. And it is, I remember as a kid, just it just killing me. I'm like crying my eyes out because it was so sad. I knew Jim Henson was dead, but the special, you know, they kept the humor and they kept the fun and they kept the 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 into the um historical part of the story going. But then you get to that ending where the Muppets all find out that he's dead. And then even though you knew that information, when they finally caught up, you know, with it, like that just crushed me. I remember that just being such it's it's um such a great uh, Because it example, built you know? emotional stakes in the characters yeah. you were watching. That's yeah, so like even if you knew that Guy Gardner was dead at the end of that story, I don't think that that would negate um, this, the payoff at the end when the characters say that. That kind of storytelling works really well. Um, but also a good example, a more upbeat example of doing a, a, a tense story in a few pages. Um, Len Wein and Walt Simonson did a two-pager um, in Detective Comics number 500 where they adapted – um, Snoopy's short novel into a Batman story. The uh, It was a dark and stormy night novel. And it's like only five sentences long and they adapt it into a Batman story. And it's great. Um, it's a really exciting, really, it's got Walt Simonson art, really fun Batman story. And it's just two pages long and it's adapted from a Snoopy comic. <laughs> yeah, as long as you have stakes and you have the reader is investing in the, in the characters and the stakes that they're reading, you can build tension in one page or five pages, 500. That's the key, is the anticipation of what's actually going to happen. Peter Parker's so origin in Amazing Fantasy number 15 was 11 pages, just 11 pages, and they got everything in there. There was a, uh, there was when I was a kid, uh, the, there was a Garfield TV special. I think it was just a half hour long. And uh, the tension, like, it was the first story that I really felt the stakes in, you know, because I didn't know what was possible in storytelling. I didn't know that everything had to reset kind of to the, uh, back to the beginning when it came to television. And Garfield and Odie are in the pound, and Odie has been there longer. And at some point, they come to take Odie away to euthanize him. And you as a kid know they're going to kill Odie. And they're dragging him. They're, you know, it's like they're, they, they come to get him and they're dragging him. Like there's that moment he and Garfield are holding hands and they grab Odie and they pull him away and you see their hands separate. And then there's a slow, agonizing drag of him down the hallway and Garfield looking after him while they play this song, Goodbye, Old Friend. And I remember as a kid, I was bawling. Oh, think about the first kill Odie. 10 minutes of Up. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's a short film. Right. In and I'm like 30 years old. What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> because they hit you. Pixar is good. Pixar is the Mola Ram of filmmakers. They come <laughs> in and they just reach in and they pull out your heart and they show it to you while it's still beating. Yeah, my Do brother who's good... um do you have any good tips for, for creating tension, you know, within your works that you've done and adapting stories to, to comics, Mark? I'm sorry. Well, I mean, I think um, we, we've gone over uh, most of the best examples. Like in, uh, so with with uh, Black Hops, because I already gave an example with Common America, um, but with Black Hops, uh, the book that Tim and I do, uh, the, the struggle that we have in that is that, so Black Hops is a commando unit um, of the US military that uses irradiated animals that have um, special abilities, but still have the minds of animals. And they have human handlers who are also commando agents and they have to go in and they have to do these Black Ops, hence the title Black Hops, because the main character is a rabbit. Um, but we have to think of different kinds of conflicts. So in the very first Black Ops uh, story, volume one, um, the conflict in that one is that uh, USAGI has to infiltrate um, a North Korean launch base and stop a nuclear uh, device from being launched to, toward Hawaii. So it has that, and we have um, 
the the clock ticking in the box so we know how much time USAGI has to get to that um, nuclear device and disarm it before it launches. So that has the ticking time bomb sort of effect going on. USAGI knows how much time he has, but so does the audience. And the reader so also that, knows what he's up against because you see him yep. – uh, them getting the, the dogs and stuff ready to. to yep. So we, to we have the, the tigers, that the tigers, the vampire it's deer, it. and ultimately um, uh, Tatzel worm, the the, uh, the cryptid that um, uh, North Koreans have, all getting in his way to try and stop him from getting towards uh, the the nuclear launch. So we have the ticking time bomb story in volume one. In volume two, uh, it's a story about uh, stopping an army that's trying to extract uh, the main villain of our series, Apex Moth, who's held. Um, in incarceration on Hart Island, which is uh, the Popper's Island graveyard island off of uh, Manhattan. And so USAGI and some new characters, Patriotter and Rigor Tortoise, have to infiltrate this island to um, stop the, the bad guys, the evil army Ningen, from extracting and, or jailbreaking uh, Apex Moth. But um, the, the other tension is that uh, they also have to stop them from sending a bunch of chupacabras, setting them loose in New York City on Long Island. Um, so they're, they're, they have to split into multi multiple groups and go off on these, these separate storylines. Um, that one has three different story arcs that happen simultaneously. Uh, so it's a three-part narrative that has the uh, the clock ticking aspect with the chupacabras, but also has the uh, got to stop the villain from escaping jailbreak aspect. Black Ops 3 is um, really a, a more straightforward story where the characters, the, the Black Ops characters, USAGI and their handler and his handler, Penelope, they have to go into a castle uh, and stop the, and they have to extract um, a, a friendly agent from that castle, from the villains' incarcerations, like a reverse of part two. So we have to find different types of conflict that you can tell. Like, what kind of operations do military commandos do? Like, what what is you know the kind of stories that they, you can tell with those characters? Um, don't constantly repeat the same one over and over again. It can't always be a ticking time bomb in every single story. Um, and it can't always just be a, a run and gun kind of story. Um, sometimes it can be a stealth mission. Sometimes it can be an extraction mi mission. Sometimes it can be a defend the base mission. Sometimes it can be a ticking time bomb mission. Um, try to change it up. Use different kinds of stories with different kinds of suspense and conflict so that the reader just doesn't get bored. It doesn't seem tedious. So this will be the last question before we start taking viewer questions, if there are any. Aaron, you know, as a comic book editor, writer, someone that's worked in other mediums as far as writing go, is there something specifically in comic books that works well for that medium in creating uh, tension and suspense that, that comic book writers need to keep in mind when you, you know, when you have your artists and everything that, that specifically translate well that maybe you can't use in movies or television or other mediums? Well, it's you know you can use the same the same tools, but uh, it's just how you use them. Uh, pacing in comic books is incredibly important, and you know it is in, in film as well. But the way that you pace something in a comic book is a lot different. You know, you don't have you can't show a quick action. You know, necessarily. So if you're if you're doing because you can do it one panel at a time. Yeah, that's right. One panel per action. So you know, if you do a jump kick, you do a jump kick. That's it. It's the character flying through the air kicking. It's not the character fly, you know, you see some scripts from, from amateur writers that come in and you have to kind of educate them on the way that it works, you know, especially if they're, you know, maybe they've written novels or, or you know, they've written TV, but they'll write something and be like, okay, in this panel, the character does a backflip then rebounds off the wall, then does a spin kick and disarms the villain. And you're like, that's not one panel, that's several panels. So, the, you know, in stories, the, you know, you can have a character investigating something and, you know, you'll see this a lot in Batman and, and uh, you know, we did it uh, a little bit in, in Darkwing, although not as much because that's not quite as serious uh you know, a story, story wise. Uh, but, you know, the character drops down into the, you know, into the base, they look around, they get a sense of what's going on. You know, there's shadows, there's, you know, different things in the darkness, they're creeping through, you know, you're building atmosphere and you'll do that in television as well. Uh, there's a great, uh, in, in Batman Return of the Joker, uh, Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, there's a great moment where we're kind of going to get the reveal of what Batman knows, you know, and why he thinks that it's impossible that the original Joker is back. And we get this flashback where Robin's been kidnapped and eventually it all comes back to Arkham Asylum. So he and Batgirl arrive at the asylum and you have that moment where they arrive, they walk up to the front, they push open the doors. And from somewhere in the asylum, you can hear Harley Quinn singing, uh, you know, Mama's going to buy you a Mockingbird. And it's echoing through the halls and it's really creepy. And there's this long 
moment of them kind of like walking through the asylum to find her. You can do that in comics, but you know, it has to be done, you know, maybe over the course of a page or even two pages. Um, you know, you can have a character exploring something and you're building the tension of what they're going to find. So there's definitely ways to, to build it in comic books. Uh, you know, it is a little bit different than you would in a, in a television show, you know, something that's animated or, you know, on uh, live action. But uh, one thing yeah. I saw, if, if the, the reader was supposed to be confused or the main character narrator, like, Things were getting discombobulated. I can't remember the name of the artist, but he starts warping his panel layouts, and they're no longer just like symmetrical. They're, they're, they start almost tilting and stuff, and you like start having to turn the book, and it kind of really messes with your like equilibrium as you're reading the story, and it kind of throws you off. I always yeah, thought that was really effective. If you were a, you, you have to have a fantastic artist to pull that off because it can just come off as jumbled. So mm -hmm. you know, knowing the talent that you're working with is, is really important. And if they can pull off something like that, you can definitely use effects like that. You think of like if you're watching a movie, you know, and a character starts to hallucinate, you know, you'd get that warping effect and you'd get things kind of like the backgrounds kind of moving in a really unnatural way. And, and you know, the camera kind of tilting uh, and, and being unsettling. And you can do that in comic books, but you have to have a really talented artist to pull it off. But yeah, it's very effective. You can create a dis very, you know, disorienting effect for the reader so that they kind of like are more invested in the character as the character moves forward so we do have a 30 dollars super chat from joe uh, brent thank you so much for supporting the channel it's uh, very generous great stuff guys thank you how do you feel about doing great. fanfic to learn to learn and figure out a pipeline before doing your own story is that a good place to start mark i, I think imagine um, it's a great place to start if you want to write a batman story Right. I mean, I think fanfic is a great way to if especially like a lot of teenagers start writing fanfic people in college. like It's a good place to start because you're playing in somebody else's with in somebody else's sandbox with somebody else's toys um, with characters you understand and know in a setting you already understand and know. It's 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 um, a great way to get started before you create your own original characters because you're working the technical with technical um, stuff down like yeah. how to write the script. Exactly. So you're learning as you're doing like, OK, I know who these characters are. What can I have them do? I know what the setting is. What can I have them do in this setting? Um, and that helps you and not not just uh, the, the fundamentals of storytelling, but also the technical aspect. It helps you with your writing, with your grammar, with your punctuation, with your spelling, with your formatting. Um, it gets a lot of that uh, out of your system. It's practice. I know a lot of people are embarrassed by their fanfic, and that's the other thing is that when you write a fanfic and you put it on like fanfiction.net and you get reviews and you get feedback, that's important too. Is that you one, it helps you understand from the feedback what you're doing wrong. Two, it helps you get over getting negative feedback. Oh, I'm sorry, Aaron, I, um, you're breaking up. What was that? No, I, I didn't no. say anything. Oh, okay. Um, but it, it also helps you build up that callous to negative feedback because, you know, if you're putting it up on the internet, a lot of people are going to come at you and just, you know, make fun of you and stuff. But that's part of growing as a writer is that you're going to have haters. You're going to have people coming at you all the time and making fun of you. And if you get that out of the way, you build that callous up early, that helps you out a lot. Um, it's okay to delete all of your fanfic if you don't want people to, to read them 10 years later when you become a better writer. Um, that's fine too. It's all just practice. I mean, it, it's one of the... I have um, tons of collections of H.P. Lovecraft stories. You mentioned them earlier with some of his um, uh, his wisdom on writing. Uh, but in a lot of those collections, especially the Apocrypha collections, they have the stuff he wrote as a teenager, stuff that I don't think he ever wanted anyone to read, stuff that was just his practice. And when you read them, you know, they're not very good. Um, there's something a teenager wrote. But you can, if you read them all chronologically um, as he wrote them, you can see him get better. You can start with um, the streets, which is a, which is really um, you know juvenilia, and then build your way up to uh, at the mountains of madness, and you can see just how much he grew from the practice of writing. Uh, so no, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with fanfic. I think it's a, it's a great um, form of practice for people. So Aaron, he also asks, is there a place we can get good constructive feedback? I know a lot of people will go to writers' workshops, and I have heard that. The feedback you there sometimes isn't constructive. It's just people kind of being dicks to each other. Is that kind of your experience on writers' workshops? It's a lot like portfolio reviews. Sometimes you'll get somebody who really cares and who really is interested in helping you grow as an artist. And other times you'll get an editor that just got roped into it. You know, they told him, you're doing portfolio reviews at this con because we've got to have somebody doing portfolio reviews. And they don't want to be there and they don't care. Uh, you know, so it, it writer's workshop. Is there a community or somewhere online where you could submit maybe your your uh, maybe your fanfic or your your some of your writings and actually get you know constructive feedback? Maybe a Reddit forum 
I imagine there's got to be some of those or or uh, some other forums like that. There's got to be. I mean, I'm not the best person to ask about that because I don't uh, frequent. You're those. too like old I, for Reddit, aren't you? Uh, what's the, what, what's the, what's the Reddit? What's uh, the that, internet? What the like fuck the, is the internet? Is that like the TikTok that the kids are all talking about. <laughs> um, no, uh, you know the the truth is is that once you're kind of established as a writer, you tend to uh, avoid those spaces because you know you get people all the time who say like, "Hey, I have this really great idea for this character," that mm-hmm. you wrote, and you're like, "That's fantastic! I can't read it." You know, like <laughs> please, you know, like I, I don't want to discourage you. We have similar you know, ideas. You can claim that it's your property because. Yeah. Right, and it becomes it becomes a huge problem. Uh, I do try to review uh, creator owned things for people. You know, if I have time, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I do for free because I like to try to to give back to you know people that are coming up. Uh, so you know, I'll offer to do that from time to time, and sometimes it takes me a really long time to get to it because you know I'm busy and and of course paying work is always going to take you know take priority. So sometimes I get a little sidetracked, but you know I do try to do that for people. Uh, so you know, on occasion, you know, you will find people who are willing to do that, and uh, I think the best thing. Um, I, I know that uh, we did a panel uh, at uh, a comic store uh, out in uh, Los Angeles once, and I had a couple of uh, aspiring animation writers come and ask if I wanted to be part of a writer's workshop that they were doing. And, uh, you know, they, they so every Saturday they would get together. And unfortunately, because I have something else that I do on Saturdays, I, I wasn't able to uh, to join them. But I, I know that it's still going. So I'm sure that, you know, yeah. you can find... It's called uh, Comic Writing 101. <laughs> like that's, this is Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, there's there's also there. I think that you, know, if you can find like-minded people, you know, there's all kinds of uh, you know all kinds of things out there. Um, you just probably got to search in, in those spaces, like you said, like Reddit and and mm-hmm. you know your various uh, internet sites. And hopefully, you're you're getting people that are actually interested in the craft and interested in helping you grow, and people who aren't there just to tear you down. Thank you very much to Joe Brent. Great question. I imagine a lot of people will have that. So this is another interesting one. I think I, I have some an idea on this one, but I'll throw this one also to Mark as well. How would you balance dialogue, inner monologue, narration, visuals to achieve tension or even effective storytelling? This is a trick that I've read online is when you're done with your script, you take a highlighter and one of them is dialogue, one of them is narration, one of them is, is general exposition. And you go through your script and you highlight all of them with all their colors. And if you have a dominant color, you probably need to rework it. There needs to be more balance. And I've told that if you use that highlighting technique, you can achieve somewhat of a balance. Is that something that you've heard of, Mark, or something you use? I'm, I have heard of that. And I think that that helps a lot, too, especially um, if you need to trim. Um, if you've got too many words, words, words on your page, because that's my big thing, is that um, I – my first draft, I'll have all the words. Um, then I go back, and before I even submit it to Tim or anybody, I go back and I trim and, and I reduce and I try to remove all those words. Now, from uh, those three examples right there, dialogue slash inner monologue slash narration, um, my first recommendation is to choose whether you want to have inner monologue or narration, third-person narration, I mean. Because if you have an inner monologue narrating the scene and a third person narration narrating the scene, that's going to be confusing as heck for your reader. Um, choose one or the other. Um, either the character is having an inner monologue that is describing uh, what he's feeling, what's going on, and providing context, or you have an omniscient third person narrator who's describing the, the context of the scene. Um, that's not the same as having, like, say, a narrative box that says, like, St. Louis, so that the characters know that you know where it's set. But you could have your inner monologue saying like, "Ah, here I am, St. Louis once again. I haven't been here in years." You know that establishes the setting, which uh, without also having a narrative box to get in the way, you don't want to confuse the the reader. Like, wait, was that narration from the third person, or was that the character thinking to himself? I'm confused. You you know you you want to have like one or the other is is my suggestion. When it comes to narration, too, you have to remember that, you know, your, your internal, uh, well, with your internal monologues, if you think of the way that you think of things, you know, when you go off a plane in St. Louis, you probably don't say to yourself, ah, St. Louis, it's been many years since I was back, but I have returned. <laughs> you know, people don't think that way. You think more in emotions and memories, but when you're writing the character, you know, you're writing the characters and you're communicating, communicating information to your audience, you do have to take a little bit more of a, uh, you know, of a storytelling approach. So you kind of have to have characters think that way because obviously you can't tell a story in emotion you know so. if your characters all think or talk the way you know we really do in real life we pick on bendis so much but god dang it that's what he does like the, he writes the way people talk you know like and then that's the boring 
Let's be yeah, honest. right. If if it's just something so dry that it's like banal, actual, real world conversation. I mean, the conversations you have like with your friend in the car when you're trying to like kill time in a, in a one hour road trip is really boring, and no one would want to read that. Um, whereas, you know, yes, you have to be kind of flowery and melodramatic sometimes just to make the stuff interesting to read for a reader. It doesn't always have to be something so dry um, and banal as like, oh, but that's not the way people talk in real life. So they shouldn't talk that way in my comic. Like, well, then people talk, people at, talk to each other about the freaking weather, you know, just to kill time. That's boring. You know, don't do that. It's people okay to also be a generally little. Do, All right, fellas. People generally yeah. don't fly and punch robots in real life easy. easy. Too, so, yeah. you know, you, you have to, uh, you know, I mean, maybe some people do. I'd like to meet them if there's a guy out there punching robots. But, <laughs> you know, uh, so you don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be hyper-realistic. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're dealing with fiction. All right, so we got another question from Jaster Plan 9. How do you feel about flashbacks being weaved in better uh, to better establish the story you're presenting? I think it's key. Like I said earlier, tips for creating better tension. You want to start the story as close to the end as you possibly can. If there's two two years worth of, of preview previous information that you need to clog in there, you're gonna bore people as they're they're waiting to get to the to the end. So if you start closer to the end and do flashbacks, you can make the story much more interesting, and then you can present the new information when it's relevant to the to the character at that moment instead of making people remember stuff from way back in the day. He had a follow up question, and I'm gonna send this over to one of the pros. Aaron, he also wants to know what's the best way to weave in flashbacks. I mean, I, I think that you just do it naturally as you go through your story. I, I think the worst way is to, you know, one thing that you want to avoid is cliche. So, you know, don't introduce a flashback with a character saying, well, you're probably wondering how we got here. <laughs> oh, God, the worst. <laughs> if you've seen somebody else do it more than once, then don't do it is generally the rule. Uh, so... You know, a good way to do flashbacks is, you know, like, let's say you're doing a Batman story and you've got Batman, like, investigating something, like, you know, and like the killing joke, you know, he's investigating things and he's thinking back to interactions that he's had with the Joker, you know, and, and remembering things. And, and, you know, that's the way to do it. The best way to do it is... You want the flashback close to when it's pertinent to what the character's experience. Exactly. And, and if you're built... And, and again, that's another way to build tension because you're using the emotions of these past events to inform the present. And that's another way that you're going to have people connect to your story. Okay. We got one final question from Jasper Plan, Plan, uh, Plan 9. Mo, uh, Aaron, is omnis omniscient narration ever necessary unless you're breaking the fourth wall? I mean, it can be. I mean, nothing is nothing in storytelling aside from, you know, building tension and having, you know, all the things that we talk about. Like, as far as your framing devices and your narrative devices, none of them are necessarily necessarily. Uh, absolutely necessary it just depends on the type of story that you're trying to tell um you know one of the things that mark said earlier is that you don't want to have the omniscient narrator and the internal monologue those those get confusing and they they really do the only time that you can really get away with that is if you're writing a comedy story like you know i could do it in darkwing or you could do it like in a deadpool story where you have the omniscient narrator and then you have the characters in her monologue but with those powerpuff girls right where the, yeah, the narrator's a character in of himself <laughs> yeah and eventually those two things are going to intersect so if i was doing that in darkwing the narrator's describing a scene and then darkwing's having his inner monologue about what's going on eventually they're going to get to an argument and that's going to break the fourth wall. But you kind of have to have that type of story in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, otherwise you end up with like, you know, the squirrel girl kind of narration where it's like, here's squirrel girl. Oh, she hate she loves candy, but she hates diapers or something. I don't know, like, whatever, stupid. Like, uh, like, wait, is a narrator narrator a character? Why is the narration so sassy? What's This is terrible. No, the, right, the writer, in that case, the writer was a character. He was just so delighted yeah. and in love with himself that he was inserting himself <laughs> into every single scene. And it was the most annoying thing on the planet. So, you know, don't, don't do, that's another, another don't. Don't do Squirrel Girl. Never, you never so, go full Squirrel Girl. <laughs> we got a final question from L. Kemlo C. Mark, I'm sorry, Eric. Mark. God, what am I doing? Yeah. Mark. How could one maybe further push emphasis on a character's injuries visually within a story? I've seen this in a comic once. It was cool. It might have been too cool for comics, but they did the bone break, like visual inset. When the guy was breaking people's arms, you were getting to see it like it was in an X-ray. I thought that was I love <laughs> I didn't say emphasis. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a great technique. It's um, It, it is used a lot. In fact, there's this terrible... 
anime called Tekken, the motion picture. They, they rushed it out after uh, Street Fighter II, the animated uh, film, was so popular. And it's terrible. But literally the only part of that awful anime film that I can recall is a scene where some, some nobody tries to punch the main character. And the, the visual freezes. And we get an x-ray of his arm. And we see it, his arm, the bone, breaking in five different places. And then it cuts back to, to like real time and the guy just starts screaming like, oh my God, and gripping his arm because it's broken in five places. Like that was a really cool way of like, of emphasizing the, uh, the, the injury and <laughs> Putting how Putting an emphasis on a syllable. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, I mean, yeah. I, and obviously you can't do everything that way, but there are fun ways that you can, you can show an injury. Um, you can have uh, the inset panel and one thing that I'm not an artist, and I think a lot of this is a better question for an artist, but uh, one thing I notice that people do is that, that artists do, is that it can be an action scene, and it can be the character getting hit. And you can have like a frame within that one large splash page, and it's not a panel, but it's like a panel frame just within that splash page of like the character's shoulder, of the impact so that it brings emphasis onto that um, impact zone. And you put so in you a know, little oh, crack sound like you know yeah, something like, is broken. So you know that the character getting hit in the shoulder isn't just them taking a regular blow. Like, that's really important. That's so – that's probably something that I should pay attention to. You know what the worst then, is, Mark? Yeah? When you're reading Iron Man and it's just Tony it's Stark Tony. reciting you his injuries. Yeah, I'm losing like, blood now. I'm getting faint. Got to keep pushing on. I'm like, oh, God. Yeah, I think that, that's that you as a writer. Marvel, I think a lot of that has to do with the Marvel method, too, is that uh, yeah. you know, the, the writer has listed something that needs to happen, and the artist hasn't necessarily drawn it. So now that they have to now they have to get it across through the dialogue. You see that a lot in comics uh, that are drawn by uh, Chris Boccolo, uh, who is, he has gorgeous, gorgeous art, but his storytelling is, is al it just seems like it's almost never on point because the writers are always having to have the characters think about what's happening. Right. If if the vis if the visuals of the comic aren't getting the information across to you, and you almost have to counterintuitively have the character think about how much something hurts when the visuals don't show how much it hurts, that's a disconnect between script and art that takes the reader out of the experience. And that's why it's so important for the writer and the artist to uh, communicate directly and not have like like an entire team of editors acting as interference between the two of them because that's when you end up with that disconnect. You know, Wes, well, what, what might be what might be good is you should just do a second show where instead of uh, Mark and I, you have Tim and Silvani, and you talk about the artistic side of it. So I would I want to do some with the letter a colorist and with some regular artists. I have a few more episodes I want to do with them specifically. Let me, uh, yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll get you some people that maybe uh, would be good to talk to. Yeah, I think that would be a lot of fun. So that's basically going to wrap us up. I, I know there's another question up there, but we've been going for an hour and 15 minutes. And I do need to say thank you to Jasper Plan 9 for the 499 Super Chat. Just a tip in diaper money. Thanks, Wes. Well, thank you, and I appreciate it. Yes, I do have the mark on my wall. I saw, And it's gotten bigger, if you didn't notice, because now my two-year-old, these the, the original one was from my six-year-old when he was two. But now that my second child is two, he has now decided to start ripping paint off the walls. It's a right like passage. I said, <laughs> I don't know why it keeps happening. Just oh, man, don't fatal? let them eat the lead paint chips, please. You, because you don't boys, want boys physically damage things. That's what boys <laughs> Everything. do. Yes. I don't even want to get into it. But what's up, Fatal J? I'm sorry you showed up at the very end. You should go back and watch this. This is really good. I know Fatal J's got a Ninja comic coming out called Ninja Blast. I don't know if it's still in the Indiegogo um, like system where you can go and buy it after the fact. But if, if it is... You should go check it out because Fatal, Fatal Jays are great. Shoot me a link to that on, on Twitter. I'll check it out. This is the first I've heard of it. Oh, there you go. Fatal Jay, send a link over to uh, at Aaron Sparrow. Wait, let, let me take this down. You can see it. <laughs> Uh-oh. There it is. At Aaron Sparrow on Twitter. I forgot he's got that there. And I want to say thank you very much to everybody. Really appreciate this. I'm glad to be back. We will be back next weekend for another live writing stream 101. Thank you all, and good to see Mark and Aaron again. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Aaron, are you still there? I'm still here. I, I, wow, that's just. <laughs> uh oh. It's all uh, <laughs> You're just all over them buttons tonight, man. What's going on? <laughs>